I really find a lot of expression in doing. And so I do think that we do need to dig a little deeper and put ourselves out there beyond where we're comfortable to make the changes we want to see. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer, a slow living apparel and lifestyle brand. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having constantly in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm. One that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. Come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Hello, Emma. Good morning. Hi, Mom. It's a big week here in the seasonal transition. We just went into daylight savings time last weekend, and we've got the spring equinox coming up this weekend. So, goodbye winter. Yeah, I was so excited the first time I noticed that it was really light out at like 7 p.m. a couple days ago. I guess that would, would have been Sunday night. I knew it was coming, but I wasn't expecting that, so that was a fun surprise. <laughs> Yeah, I know people have all kinds of feelings about that, about just like changing the clock. And it is a little odd, but I do like having the light in the evenings. You know, you can take your walk later and sit outside in the late light. It's it's nice. It really is. It's also the last weekend of our open enrollment for the Almanac, which is our online community for slow living through the seasons. Yes, we just tied up our winter season of content with our book club meeting where we discussed Catherine May's book, Wintering. It felt like such an appropriate way to bring together all the activities and the topics we've been exploring over the past three months around the theme of rest. And after rest, we're now launching into a new entire theme for our spring season for the content and the activities around that theme. And In these coming weeks and months, we will be exploring the theme of Cultivate. It's really going to be wonderful. First thing is the community members will have a chance to decide what it is they want to cultivate in their lives this season. And that might be a garden or a farm or a window box or a book, a business, any other kind of thing that's been waiting deep within you beneath the surface to grow into the light. And we're also going to be doing a lot of other fun things related, like learning about vermiculture. That's growing worms. And there's going to be a new playlist. And uh, we'll be doing some backyard foraging for wild foods, some fermenting, like making kefir, and even some natural dyeing. We'll even have some writing prompts for things like poetry. And uh, we're going to be learning lasagna gardening. Lasagna gardening. If you don't know what it is, I have a hint. It's just like it sounds. Except it's not actually lasagna. Well, not exactly. Not like with the noodles and tomato sauce and stuff. But here's another hint. You could also call it instant gardening. Speaking of gardening, we're talking a lot today with our wonderful guest, Allison Morgan of Allison Simply Grows, about gardening and the plant world. In her own words, Allison is an environmentalist, gardener, slow living advocate, and mother who started Earth Star Herbals to bring flower essences and herbal products into homes and hearts. She weaves together her beautiful photography, her love for the land, sustainability, and botany with social justice and equality through her herbal work. Allison is also a writer and artist who demonstrates a life connected to the earth and her close kinship with the plant world through her writing and photographs. We were honored to have her as a presenter at our 2020 Slow Living Retreat last fall, where she taught a workshop on living into the cycles of nature. And now we're so happy to bring her back 
today on The Good Dirt as we dig a little deeper into the lovely world and work of Allison Morgan. I was born in California, which I think is a very far cry from where I am today, which is the middle of winter in the Midwest. But I studied at the University of California, Davis. But I studied climate change, natural resource use, and global health in my undergrad. I really think that's where I started with the thread of slower living, sustainable living, kind of diving into how capitalism affects people on the planet. You know, so that degree was really interdisciplinary. So it was like sociology, economics, history looking at world systems, colonialism, and kind of deconstructing. And for me, that was really what opened my eyes to the effects that we as humans, our systems have on the planet. I don't know, I had a breakdown studying. It was really hard to learn about what capitalism does, what colonialism, what effects those things have on people. And really what led me to do that degree was my mom was born in Haiti. And I've always wanted to know more about her culture, but she came here when she was really young and assimilated pretty quickly into American culture. And so I was really raised without that kind of grounding and those roots. And so I think that's kind of what led me to that degree. I met my husband in college and he was studying African history and we both became really disillusioned with academia, feeling like there wasn't really a big change that we could make to really help what we were doing. I was working at an NGO and they studied water resource use. And I just saw how a lot of that research was funded by the same organizations kind of causing the problems. And I became disillusioned and we decided that we were going to move to the Midwest, which is where he grew up, to kind of have just a slower pace of life. You know, California is even just from when I grew up, is so much more populous and the pace of life is very fast and, you know, it was very expensive if we wanted to try to start a family there. And we decided that we were going to move to the Midwest to kind of have a slower pace of life. And so that's kind of how we got to where we are today. But I really do think that my studies informed how I started to view the world and kind of dissect things. A little side note was that my dad was an artist when I was growing up and taught me how to paint and draw. So I've done that since I was like four years old. And so I spent most of my high school and, you know, beginning college years studying art. And then I kind of wanted to dig a little deeper into understanding the systems in which we live. And that's when I changed my major to international relations. And so I think today in this weird world that I exist in on Instagram is a blend of those two things. You know, like I really do apply a lot of my art background to photography and design and things like that. And then, you know, that background really does inform what I talk about to people. And how about your herbalism? Where did that kind of come in in your study of herbalism? So before that, I started... My first blog, which is Maya Terra, right after my daughter was born, we left California and we wanted a slower pace of life and we wanted to start a family. In one way, I feel like we were trying to kind of escape some of these things that we were being confronted by. And then having my daughter, I was kind of thrown back into the realities that we exist in. Of why is nobody else upset about climate change? Like, why aren't other mothers, you know, where are children going to be in 10 to 15 years? And I would hold my daughter in my arms. I couldn't really see her future. I, I would try to think of her like in high school. I didn't have a picture of her in my mind because of the uncertainty I felt like we faced. And all of my studies kind of came flooding back to me. And that's when I decided to start speaking in a more public way, or trying to connect with other people with similar values and interests about things that we could do as individuals in our everyday life to make an impact. At the time, low waste wasn't a really big thing. She was born in 2014 and I kind of had started the idea in 2015 to kind of start reaching out to people and communicating about it. And that was kind of where my blog was born and my public speaking. So my husband and I moved to Milwaukee first and our experience there was good. I really loved Milwaukee as a city, but it was still a city and it was really fast paced. 
And so we decided to move a little more rurally. And originally we had wanted to buy our friend's farmhouse. It just didn't work out for us. The farm house was kind of surrounded by cornfields and sprayed agriculture. And I had taken environmental toxicology <laughs> classes in college. And I remember emailing my professor, like, what can stop ecological drift? And can you plant, you know, like a barrier? And I was like, if I have to ask all of these questions about it, you know, it's probably not the best option for us. But we had already planted the seeds in our mind that we had wanted to move more rurally. So my friend, Hannah, who lived here, while we lived in Milwaukee, she was looking at houses for us and she was eight months pregnant at the time. And she's like, I just need to get out of the house and I just need to like get out, go and walk through houses for you if you'd like, and I can FaceTime you. And I was like, sure. Magnolia and Griffin were like two and three at the time. And we were kind of having to drive three hours back and forth every time we wanted to look at a house. And you know, that home buying process with two little ones is really hard, but she came to this house in maybe it was March at the time we were living in a 1900 square foot home and we were looking for something comparable if possible, but she found us this little cottage, 1200 square feet, three bedrooms, one bath. And so it was downsized for us. And I remember she came and walked through and I was kind of like, I don't know, that's a little small. <laughs> And it didn't land on our list. And so we kept looking. We made offers on a couple other houses. They fell through. And we had already put our house on the market and it sold in one day. And so we were like, okay, we really need a house. <laughs> We've already decided we're going to do this. Like, let's go. What, whatever happened to that house Hannah walked through? I ended up finding the number for the person who owned this house and I messaged her. She was like, oh, you know, I, I didn't know what happened to you. She's like, we actually have two offers on the house right now, but oh, no. if you could drive out in the next day, we would consider your offer. And by this time it was maybe May. And I think Hannah walked through in March in the winter time. So we loaded up the kids the next day and drove three and a half hours and we arrived here and I fell in love with the gardens. So the house is really small. It's very cozy. AJ works from home and I work from home and two kids, but the house is on 0.6 acres and the woman who owned the house was an herbalist oh. and she bought the house. Her grandmother loved gardening. So her grandmother planted a peony garden and they had like a 70 year old grapevine and asparagus patch and raspberries and so the woman who owned the house kind of just bumped that up a couple notches and she planted flower gardens and medicinal gardens and she grew most of her produce here on this lot and we visited and the apple tree was blooming and the lupins were in bloom and so I basically threw all of my reservations out the window. We signed an offer that day wow. <laughs> and she took our offer over the other two offers. And her main reasoning was that she basically saw how much I fell in love with the gardens. And the other two people were talking about maybe changing them or getting rid of some of them because there's a lot of plants here. Yeah, we made an offer. We moved in a couple of months later and it was my big mission to find out who all of these plant friends were in the garden. So I got myself a little Peterson guide on wildflowers. And, you know, she did walk me through the garden. I took a video of it and she kind of introduced me to everybody that was here. You know, this is Minarda and the lemon balm lives here. And, you know, she knew all of the oh. plants. You know, she really did have a magical touch in how she laid out the gardens. I think she used some like biodynamic principles. There are kind of crystals all over the garden. And she really put her love and attention into this place. And so my journey with herbalism really started. I think I've always been, you know, sensitive to plants and nature. And that really came from my art background. I'm drawn to the aesthetics of them, but then this became a portal for me to understand plants in a deeper way. It was just kind of my experience just listening to the plants and observing them and I remember the first plant I 
decided to work with was lemon balm because I kept mowing over it. And then at the smell of the yeah. lemon balm after you mow over, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, that plant, what is that? You know? And so I looked it up in my book and I crushed it in my fingers and I tasted it and I, you know, Googled it and figured out how to use it. But I had a lot of reservations about plant medicine because, you know, like if you're looking in a Peterson guide, this is toxic and this is this. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I was really nervous to start experimenting in that way with plants because I never knew really of people that use them. Mm-hmm. And I think that there is that disconnect, you know, it's like you're drinking tea out of a tea bag. It's tea. You don't really think about the plants that are in it right. or things like that. And so it was that September I'd made a thyme tincture and a lemon balm tincture. And then I let them sit on the shelf for like four months before I tried them because I was so nervous. I was like, oh my goodness, am I going to kill somebody? (laughs) You know, but really within the dead of winter, when I pulled out the lemon balm, it was amazing to have that plant growing up in California. I've never experienced winters like this. And so having a little taste of life and like lemon balm is such a friendly plant it's you know in the mint family and it brings such joy when you work with it so I was really glad that that was one of my first plant allies it's remarkable to me the depth of your knowledge in such a short period of time you really have learned a lot and are able to teach people and guide people through so much and it goes to show you I think that And you recognized, I think, as you described, kind of moved in with these plants and you lived with them and you accepted them as sort of cohabitants of your space. (laughs) And that makes such a difference Mm -hmm. because it's not just book knowledge when you start working with plants. It's sort of a communion with them. And you learn that, you know, pretty quickly that it's not like medicine. It's not like something you buy in the drugstore. It's just kind of learning about something and learning literally its personality and its properties and its smells and its taste and all the different things you can do with it. And it's, it's really such a journey. So I love your story and how it just sort of worked its way into your life by, you know, sort of a destiny, if you will, of like just having it integrated in such an an organic way. Yeah. You really sort of became the caretaker. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I felt that way, you know. I felt like, okay, she chose me. Yeah. You know, (laughs) she had two other offers, and there was something about me that, like, resonated with her as, like, the person that was going to steward this place that meant so much to her. You know, it was in her family. It was like a rabbit hole for me, like, fell down the rabbit hole of working with plants because... For me, I was in therapy and doing a lot of things for my own personal work. It wasn't until I started connecting with plants that I had some of the biggest breakthroughs in my personal work and in my relationships. And I was concerned with sustainability. I was concerned with, I don't know, passing something down to my children preparing them for whatever futures they might have. And so at the beginning of working with plants, I was like, well, this is such a tangible skill I can teach my kids to identify a plant and know how it works and what they can use it for. That kind of fit into that sustainability, resilience, self-sufficiency kind of model. But then it became so much more and it did become relationship with plants. And, you know, everyone here in my family, they know the plants now. My husband is starting to, you know, really get into it. He has his plant allies, the things that he uses and works with all the time. My daughter, before COVID, you know, would be playing with a friend and her friend got a bee sting and she went and found plantain and like chewed it up and put a poultice on. And she was like five, you know, it's amazing. Just like, you know, and she would see yarrow and she'd be like, Oh, yarrow is what goes at my boo-boos or everybody was finding their allies and finding plants around us that resonated with them. And I really do feel like the plants were calling me in the summertime. I step outside my door and it was just like, 
buzz, right? Of all of these different voices. Come and work with me. Come, (gasps) come find out who I am. And then I'd be like, I I can only do one thing at a time. (sighs) Who's talking? And then photography also became this other way that I began to commune with plants. And that's kind of when I really started working with flower essences. Black Eyed Susan was really calling me and I was Googling it and I was like, what does Black Eyed Susan do? And I still had a very allopathic way of thinking about plants. I was like, okay, it's not medicinal in any real way. What does it do? And why does it keep calling me? And I stumbled upon the flower essence of it. So I made one. And then again, I let it sit on the shelf for a long time because I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, yeah. I make it and then I'm a little hesitant. And then I ended up going on a retreat with one of my herbal teachers, Asia Suler in North Carolina. And so she does a lot of intuitive plant medicine and kind of more of the spiritual, you know, psychological, emotional aspects of plants and their like capacity to heal. And then I just started getting called by the flowers. You know, the crab apple tree is in bloom and I'm out there taking pictures of it. And I come back inside my house and AJ had taken the kids for a little drive to give me some alone time. I'm sitting there after taking these pictures of when a crabapple tree is in bloom, all of these little pink five petaled flowers. And I sit down and I'm looking at the pictures and all of a sudden I feel so irritated, so upset. And I'm looking at my house and I'm like, oh, everything is like dirty and messy. Just all of a sudden, just like very irritated. And I'm thinking about my friend, Hannah, who also has two kids, but her house always seems, you know, meticulous and immaculate. And I'm just like, (laughs) these like dialogues and conversations are happening in my head. And then I'm like, I wonder what crab apple does. And I look it up in my flower book and a crab apple is for those overly concerned with their environment, and oh. cleanliness. And I was blown away by oh. this. Oh, I just had this deep connection and experience with this plant. And it was telling me what it does oh my God. In, in essence through, you know, stories and my own mental conversations. And I was really blown away. I would love for you to explain to our listeners what you mean by flower essence and how is that different from (laughs) you hear you know essential oils and tinctures and all Mm -hmm. these and that's too much to go into but the flower essence is something different so if you would explain what that is and and how you make it and also and how you use it a flower essence is essentially an infusion of water with a bloom whereas a tincture is it's kind of like a maceration of the actual plant, the leaves or the roots or the flowers cut up and infused in an alcohol to pull out the physical properties of that plant that works on the biochemistry of your own body. A flower essence is a much subtler form. So it's basically bloom floated in water in the sun usually. And you usually let that sit for maybe three to four hours. And then you preserve that essence with some alcohol. The idea behind it is that flowers are energetic beings and they carry messages. I like to think about it because humans have these relationships with flowers, right? someone loves a rose and that's the flower they're drawn to and they smell it and it's just amazing and has all this, you know, these emotional effects on the body and the mind and the spirit. I like to think back to the Victorian era where they had the language of flowers, right? Victorians were really obsessed with flowers, what flowers mean, and they would write, you know, a rose is love or this is purity or this is this. And I think that In some ways, they're picking up on this psycho-spiritual aspect that flowers are these energetic beings that give off their own energy and message. So the idea of a flower essence is that you are preserving that in water to take and to interact with your own energy. Hey, this is Emma, just popping in to say if you like music and you like Lady Farmer, then you might enjoy the Lady Farmer playlists. They're all over on Spotify. You can find them under my name, Mary Emma Kingsley. About a year and a half ago, I started making seasonal playlists. As each season came along, I would make a musical compilation of what was inspiring me during that time. This spring, we're so excited to have partnered with Numero Group. 
Numero Group is definitely the place to go if you've been in a musical rut and you don't know what to listen to. They've got dozens of playlists for every kind of listener, from pastoral folk to cosmic country, every flavor of eccentric soul. You can find their playlists on Spotify, Apple Music, and Deezer, or you can explore their website, which is like this beautiful treasure trove of rich stories and histories from forgotten musical legends all through the 20th century. It's super fun. If you're looking for more of the plays that I make personally, those are going to be on the Almanac, so you'll find those in there. And until then, enjoy the rest of the episode. The first time I made a flower essence, I was like, mm, this is really silly. <laughs> like, you know, what? Yeah. Like, this is very woo. And, you know, I'm not opposed to woo, but I'm also very much like, I need knowledge uh-huh. and I need information and I need data. And so to like accept this side of it was a little difficult for me at first. Flower essences are preserving the energetics of the flower and water. And it's not working on the biochemistry of your body. It's working more on the spiritual, emotional, the more subtle layers. And how do you use it? You had described how the crab apple kind of revealed to you what was going on in your head. Explain that a little bit. So yeah, for the story about the crab apple, I think more about what was happening was it was more revealing yeah. how it works. Yeah. Not necessarily something that was bothering me because that's not how I am normally. And so I think in that instance, it was kind of showing me the ways that it works. So you take a flower essence, you take about four drops. So you make a mother essence and then you dilute that to work on a more subtle level. And so you take four drops of it. You can take it up to four times a day. And so a flower essence can work in a couple different ways from the instance of the crab apple, you know, say someone feels that way, that feels like they're constantly uneasy because their environment is in disarray or is kind of obsessed with the appearance of things. They could take that crab apple flower essence to help them find relief, if that makes sense. Yeah. So Dr. Edward Bach in the 1920s, he was kind of the first one to really use flower essences in like a research-based kind of way. I think people have probably always worked with flowers in this kind of way is my yeah. guess, you know, indigenous communities and things like that. So Star of Bethlehem is one of the more well-known ones and it's in Rescue Remedy, which is something you probably see yeah. on your you know, health food shelves. And that is a flower essence formula. I think people take it and they're like, oh, they don't really know what's in it. But Star of Bethlehem is for trauma. It's for helping you feel more safe and calm. Yeah, my daughter really resonates with that one, especially this year after the pandemic. And so you can take it to help balance emotional states in your body. We're Flower Essence fans, but it is hard to describe to people who don't know. Yeah, and it's amazing because in one sense, it sounds kind of vague, like you talk about the spiritual energy of a flower, but in another sense, they're very specific, you know, for the overly nostalgic or Mm -hmm. a person Mm -hmm. that's overly concerned about family members or, you know, it gets really specific and you think, how in the world did someone discover this? And I know that it's a Dr. Bach that did this back Mm -hmm. in the 30s. He codified it and and sort of assigned these properties to each one. But isn't it something that's sort of subjective that a person could discover for themselves how they affected them? Or, Or am I going off in the wrong direction there? I think there's something very true to that. I think there's something true to someone having a personal experience with the flower essence. And I think that that's also kind of this idea of that plants are more holistic and they work on different levels and they have different expressions in a person. But, you know, even if you're looking through a flower essence dictionary or whatever, you'll see one flower maybe in like seven different categories. So it's like, oh, for anger and then for, you know, repressing emotions or whatever, you know, and I think that that also lends to how complicated our emotional states can be and like how layered they can be too. But then I also think that people tend to have the same reaction or experience with a flower essence, just as we do with colors. You know, you might be colorblind or you might, you know, experience red in a different way, but red is kind of still red. Yeah. And I think that flowers are kind of the same way. The idea that they are beings 
that resonate their own energy and a species of a flower has a certain resonance. That's so fascinating. And, and you make these and you sell these through your Earth Star Herbal business? Yes, I sell them oh. through my website. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, you know, just kind of one of those things with COVID. I had big plans this year. I had a really grand plan to list all of my flower essences I have, but it's not happening right now. So, so the ones that I do have listed are ones that I've had a lot of personal experience with and I've shared with other people that have expressed that they have had really positive experiences. And yeah, I hope to add a couple more in the coming months for the things we're navigating right now. Rest is one of the things that I'm really focusing on and I've been working with a couple flower essences and experimenting with a couple blends for how to turn your mind off. And that's our almanac theme, our online community for the season of winter is rest. So what flower essences are you using for that? The main flower essences I'm using are chamomile, which mm -hmm. is kind of and obvious, <laughs> I think, right? Chamomile, yeah. lavender, and I've been also using blue vervain, which mm -hmm. is an interesting plant as a tincture is a very intense plant for me, at least when I use it. So one of my teachers, Seja Popham from Evolutionary Herbalism, kind of talks about it as like for a type A person who has a lot of buzzy thoughts and stuff kind of bringing you back down into your body. And it works similarly for me as a flower essence, but with less of a physical impact. I've been trying to think about plants that work kind of with a thinking mind because I feel yeah. like that's where I'm having trouble resting. I just feel like my brain is kind of constantly working or thinking or mm -hmm. processing. You know, I think that is also kind of in this place that we are in, you know, with the pandemic is your brain is constantly working and kind of analyzing the situations that you're in and yeah. you're like a whole nother level to thinking that's happening. It kind of reminds me of early motherhood, to be honest, you know, like trying to keep a baby alive as your brain chemistry changes and you're like, yeah. is it breathing? <sighs> Have I fed it? Oh, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> your mind is busy kind of uh, trying to adapt to something totally new. And I think, you know, so much about rest is getting to a place where we just let ourselves rest, giving ourselves permission to do it, getting to the place where you say, it's really okay, I'm not wasting time, or it's not like I should be doing something else. That's a place where you have to really mind your thoughts to get into a place that's really restful. And that's where I think these plant allies can really help us. You know, they just give us a little nudge in those directions. Totally. I think that kind of goes back to these ways in which we're kind of conditioned, yeah. right, to think that we always must be productive or... Mm -hmm be in these kind of like, I should be being the best version of myself or I need to be, you know, being better like new year's resolutions, right? Like I need to be propelling myself forward. There has to be a sense of progress. And I think those can be very contradictory to like resting. Yeah. You know, it's, there's often times where I feel like well, if I just don't do something for a whole day, there's almost like this kind of shame or like guilt, like, oh, you should have been doing something productive with yourself. Mm -hmm. Just like laid around the house and did nothing. This idea that we need to be these productive beings all the time. It can be hard to override that kind of programming. Yeah. Allison, can you talk to us a little bit about gardening by the moon or living your life around the cycles of the moon and how you do that? I do garden by the moon, but not in the biodynamic sense, which is, I think, can be rigid. So I've worked with the moon in my own personal healing process. And then I found myself doing it in my garden. So I had started with planting intentions with a new moon and kind of release on a full moon and incorporating moon cycles into my life. And I pay attention very closely to what astrological sign the moon is in just because it really resonates with me and I find that when I align my activities with the signs that I am more productive and I'm not fighting against it's like if you're trying to build something on a Pisces moon which is like really watery and emotional mm -hmm. you know it's kind of like you're working against the stream of things mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I've then found myself aligning it's actually happening naturally, which is kind of a strange thing for me. I would plant seeds 
at the right time to plant seeds, kind of without knowing that that's what I was doing. And then I started to pay attention to it more. And I started to research what biodynamics is and what lunar phase gardening is. And so a lot of those activities in the garden are also aligned with those astrological signs and how much gravitational pull the moon has on water in the soil. And so I just found this natural kind of connection between paying attention and tuning into these things for myself and then seeing that aligning myself with that in my gardening was actually very beneficial. It started by accident, really. So give us a specific example of gardening by the moon and how that's worked for you. I guess I'm like an every human instant gratification kind of gal. (laughs) Like I feel like I see the most effects of gardening by the moon in planting seeds. So on a new moon, there's no moon in the sky. And they say not to plant seeds directly on a new moon, but a couple days after is a window in which you can start to plant seeds up until the full moon. And as like the moon is growing, as the moon shifts the tides, you know, it also has an effect on water in our bodies and in the soil and in the plants. One way I work with that is planting seeds a little bit after the new moon during the waxing phase, which is the new moon going to a full moon for two reasons. One is because that light is growing in the sky. So the moonlight is actually brighter. So some people say that that also has an effect on the plant's growth because the reflection of the sun, the evening light that affects the plants, but also that gravitational pull. And so I was literally shocked. I planted seeds a couple days after a new moon, maybe five days. I think they were radish seeds in my greenhouse. And within seven days, I had these little seedlings. Then I was looking at the packet and I was like, was that supposed to happen that fast? And I think it was just that, you know, the combination of those are more quickly germinating seeds and the times that I planted it. The other way I work with the lunar phases is harvesting. So I try to to harvest plants that I'm going to use for medicinal purposes, but also certain crops, harvesting them around a full moon. How do you incorporate the lunar cycles into your own life as well? My kids are the first one to be like, mom, the moon is out. They know I'm obsessed, right? But You know, there's lots of different resources to use and to look at if you're interested. The most simple way that I started, I think it was right after my son was born in 2016 or 17, was on a new moon, planting my own seeds of intention. I was in therapy at the time. And so I was writing down things I was working on. A lot of that was around communication. That's a big thing for me. I had a hard time communicating my emotions with people. I had a lot of ideas in my head and a lot of things that I wanted to do. And I was experiencing a lot of shame and self-doubt, which I, you know, started to unpack as like internalized racism, which was my own racist ideas about who I was and what I could do as a black woman. And so I'd been working with my therapist around that. And so I started on a new moon, just kind of writing down intentions. One of my intentions was I would like to write a blog. I would like to improve my communications with my husband, whatever it was. New moon, you set those intentions. And then, you know, the cycle from a new moon to a full moon is two weeks So then on a full moon is kind of a release. So I wrote down things that I would like to release. And so I would write, I would like to release these thoughts that I have about myself. I would like to release this and that. And what I found even more than writing it down was that full moons make you feel crazy. You know, like full moons are really energetically potent. And I would cry. I'd write these things down and I would just have these emotional cathartic experiences on a full moon. And, you know, one of those things that I was working on was I wouldn't cry. It was something that I felt shame around from being a child. And if I had some really intense emotions about things, I had a hard time communicating it to people and I wouldn't cry in front of people. 
And so for me, connecting to this energy of a full moon and crying and letting it out, it was like, you know, my own emotional waters, right? I was finding such power in working with those cycles. And then from a full moon, then back to the new moon, that's like the full 28 days in the lunar cycle. And then I started really keeping track of what I was doing. I started it because I wanted to journal and I had a really hard time getting myself to sit down and write in a journal after becoming a mother. It was like this external reminder, like, oh, I don't see the moon out. Is it almost a new moon? I need to write down these things. And then, oh, the full moon is out. I just need to sit down and write these things. And so it also became kind of a time piece for me to remind me, oh, two weeks check-in. It's time to write now. You know, and it was a way to keep myself accountable instead of being like, you need to try to do this every day. It was yeah. like this external reminder of, oh, hey, check in with yourself. That really leads um, into the next thing I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about balancing motherhood and slow living and your business and your writing and your photography and and how has 2020 and COVID sort of affected all of that? You know, sometimes I feel like I'm hanging on by a thread and I wonder how I do anything that I do and other times I feel on top of it. So I live in the Midwest. My mother-in-law lives three hours away. My parents live in California. COVID has been hard in the fact that we don't have family around to take the kids. Took them out of school last March and I decided to homeschool. My son is four and my daughter is six and they were both in a Waldorf kindergarten. And so for me, it felt like a natural extension of kind of what I already did with them when they were younger at home and to limit exposure just to keep them home. But I have appreciated COVID for a couple of reasons that I think kind of align with slow living. And I say this really feeling privileged that I have the opportunity to do this and that both me and my husband have the capacity to make our means working from home. And I know that that's not an option for a lot of people. And so I feel really grateful, but our routines and our rhythms have become more solid. My husband used to travel for work before and he, you know, sang in a local choir and he would play sports in the evenings, you know. So he was always going and then I was doing my things. And I just feel like it's really solidified our life as a family and our rhythms. And so I feel a lot of support from him. And so he tries really hard to give me time to do my things. And then I try to focus on how are we using our energy in the day to day? You know, I'll take weekends to do my creative content. I try to take photos throughout the day, but post them at certain times and like right in the evening. So it's made us much more aware of how we're using our energy and how to think more intentionally about what we're doing and when we're doing it. You know, it's like, I have to know what I'm, I've got coming up or I need to be able to like communicate to him like, hey, I'm going to need a weekend, take photos for something and write. When before I could kind of fit that in. And it's been difficult for me because I don't know, I have a lot of creative energy and it wants to do its thing when it wants to. And so I sometimes feel like I don't necessarily have control over that aspect of my life anymore. It's made me really channel that creative energy and focus it. And we've just pared down things in our life. Like I asked my mother-in-law for a Roomba, like the robot vacuum, you know, because I was just like, (laughs) how can I take some things off my plate? What are things that I can ask for help with and like, you know, (laughs) delegate to other people? Because I am the type of person that likes to have control over the things I'm doing. I really find a lot of expression in doing. And so I had to take that down a notch and I'm like, okay, I need to just focus my energy on some things and... I can't do it all. I feel like just like a lot of self-revelation in living through this time, just like this idea, it's a collectively imposed slowdown was such an interesting thing to live through. Yeah, I had people messaging me and reaching out like, oh, uh, that's blooming outside of my house. And I'd never noticed it before. And I've lived here for 10 years. For me, it was like this moment that was an opening for possibility for different ways of seeing and different ways of living. And I really thought that could be brought out more 
And I think that it's just, just kind of manifested in people's lives in different ways. And it was just really encouraging to see it. The earth was almost rebounding from all of the humans oh. stopping. It was so exciting to hear about the water clearing up and the dolphins coming back. <laughs> and oh, that was just thrilling. You know, I don't, I don't know how much staying power all that has. And we get all sped up, but, and you use the word intentionality. I think that might be the common denominator. When we ask people how 2020 affected your life, you know, so many people say, you know, our day to day was so much more intentional. We had to decide how we we're going to spend our time. And yeah. What does good dirt mean to you? It can be literally or metaphorically or any way you want to talk about it. So a couple like things popped up into my head and it was almost in more of like a metaphorical term, you know, kind of the idea of composting the things that are, I don't want to say bad, but the idea that there are these emotions and that there are these, even just thinking about 2020 as a year and how tumultuous it was and all of the stuff it brought up, right? The idea of that going back into yeah. the soil and the dirt of your lives so that something new can come out of it and be reborn. Yeah. All of those things, when they come to that place of being in the ground and being worked back in nourishing, and it's also like a fresh start. And, but then it also is, it's not for nothing. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. Allison, what is it that you most want people to understand about the work you do? I think it's an important aspect for me. And I think I kind of talked about it a little bit before is that I I'm really trying to share as much of my journey with other people as possible. And for me, it manifests in this way of as authentic of words as I can express because communication is one of those things that I've worked on and will continue to probably work on the rest of my life. So authentic words, but also like showing the beauty that I find in my everyday life. My life is not always beautiful and there are piles of laundry everywhere all the time, but I really do feel that there's something life-giving about the beauty that can be found in our everyday experiences that can really get us through hard times. And so I try to share those things because they are getting me through really hard things, but that change is possible and there's new ways of being and you don't have to be stuck in things that feel really hard for you. Finding that light in your own life that can pull you through. And so a lot of my work I think is in service to just sharing my own experience and the hopes that it inspires other people, but that I also think collectively that humans have a lot of work to do and we can do it together and in community with each other and community with plants. And there are a lot of things that are possible. For what it's worth, you do such a beautiful job of, yes. of that. We even have within our own team once in a while, someone will be like, y'all look at Allison's story today. It's like giving me life. It's so sweet. Yeah, <laughs> it really yeah is. we want to affirm what you're doing out there it's really beautiful and I think you're doing a great job accomplishing what you just spoke about yeah as you were talking I remembered one more question I want to ask you about where you started telling your story of your disillusionment with academia and wanting to you know go in search of this slower life and having a lot of fear and anxiety for your children in the future and if any of that has changed really since you are in this house and working with the plants and how that has shifted, if at all. Yes and no, I think. I feel like I have to attach less to the urgency that I know that is necessary to change the larger systems. And I think that part of that journey from going to academia to motherhood It was impacts that I could see in my daily life, acting a certain way and then having like a certain manifestation in my life, you know? And I think that was part of the dissolution with these large systems, right? It was just like feeling like, oh, well, what I do doesn't really matter. And like, Mm -hmm. there are so many things at work that I don't have an impact on. So how can I bring it to the day to day? I think that there is a lot of solace in that, knowing that your everyday actions are as intentional as you can make them and that you're trying really hard. But it has been hard in the sense that I feel like I don't see 
as many of the shifts that I would have liked to see between then and now that would make me feel like things will be better for our kids. I mean, I think I don't really want to get political, but just the last, you know, four years or so it has yeah. really slowed down those like larger milestones of, you know, things we need to see happen to know that there will be some kind of security for our kids in the future. I think looking globally, it makes me sometimes feel a little bit better is like, oh, other countries are doing the things I know we need to do. And I have to believe that other people are feeling this call and they are doing their work to move us to a point that things can be shifted. So in my day-to-day -day life really does feed my hope, yeah. but sometimes I'm like, humanity, I <laughs> yeah. don't know. <laughs> But don't you think, I think this is how we do it. You know, you're right. We can't all be out there yelling and screaming about, you know, the way things should be. All we really can do is what we're doing and be an example to others and shine a light on our authentic selves and the way we feel we want to be. And then you, I mean, just look at you. I mean, you're, you're this wonderful example to so many people. So you are doing it. Just know that, you know, you're, you're being an example every day of, of how to slow down and look around you and observe nature. And, and, and those people who look out their windows and never knew what those plants were. And yeah, I mean, it's just, you're being a really shining example of everything you're talking about. You're doing your work. So my husband and I, we fell in love in this phase of political activism in our lives. You know, it was kind of the Occupy movement at our campuses and, you know, there were fee hikes. People were peacefully protesting on campuses and we both were in political actions and we met and like fell in love in this very like heightened activist yeah. space. And then, you know, we decided we were both facing burnout from that and from school and the bureaucracies of academia and decided to go this direction. But then sometimes we feel like, was that the only effective political mm. action? And I think me and him differ on this discussion, you know, because sometimes he's like, no, that's direct action is the way to change things. And then I sometimes am like, well, maybe this is a way to change things too. And yeah. we're kind of settling in more and more to this idea that living into your full purpose, just being who you are and whatever you are called to do in like a wholehearted way, not to serve your ego or anything, but to try to live a purpose is a way to accomplish goals. And living into your purpose can be radical. For instance, you know, our consumer decisions, what we buy or what we decide not to buy. I mean, those things are radical. You might say, I'm not going to buy any plastic water bottles. <laughs> that might seem like really small, but like, what if everybody did that? You know, I think it's bigger than we think. I really do hope so. I mean, in politics is not working particularly well either. So a person could spend their entire lifetime fighting that battle and come out where, you know, so. And I yeah. do think, you know, this summer was a really intense one for me with the Black Lives Matters. Yeah movements and being, you know, one of a handful of people of color in a 4,000 rural town in the middle of Wisconsin. Yeah. And I'm really grateful that I had the platform that I did because my work was sharing my own experience of being a woman of color. And for good or for bad, I think that that had an impact on people's understandings and I'm not out there protesting, but I'm here mm. sharing my experience yes. the best I can, you know, but I also think that a lot of the changes that need to be made will take us stepping up every time I do something that is like, I'm always stepping outside of my comfort zone. I'm always really digging deep for this courage to do it. And I think that it's really easy to be complacent and not push yourself towards those things that are calling you. And so I do think that we do need to dig a little deeper and put ourselves out there beyond where we're comfortable to make the changes we want to see. Yeah, well, what you described, what you're doing, digging deep and finding the courage, that's what I think that's the work. That's all we can do. I think that's what we're here to do is to have the courage to 
you know, to do what we're put here to do, whatever that means. Take the know. next step. <laughs> and it's so encouraging. Even just hearing you talk about doing that is inspiring and encouraging. And thanks for your support and, you know, your like requests and invitations are keeping me like stepping out of my comfort zone. <laughs> we're like, get on the screen. <laughs> yeah, we record like, you. Ah. yeah. Thanks so much for coming and talking with us today. And is there anything you want to say about like a little shout out here at the end so people can find you? You can find me, my conscious living, my cottage, my garden. You know, Instagram is like a little window into someone's life. That's at Allison Simply Grows. And then you can find my herbal supports. And also my blog, which I plan to do a little more of if I can squeeze out the time this year at allisonmorgan.com. That's both my blog and my shop. Well, thank you so much, Allison. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I'm sure we'll be connecting again soon. Thank you, Allison for bringing us into your magical world this morning. I enjoyed it so much. Now I can't wait to get out in the garden. Yeah, I particularly love hearing her talk about how she found her current plot of land and how she communes with the plants there and how she sort of came into this work with the flower essences. If you enjoyed this episode, there's many more on the good dirt and there's a lot more content just like this on Instagram at We Are Lady Farmer. And like we mentioned in the intro, we have our online community, the Almanac. It closes enrollment this weekend. March 22nd is the last day to enroll. So if you're interested, definitely get in there. Share this episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. And we hope to see you next week. Thanks for listening. Goodbye, everybody.